Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, depending where you are. We're gonna go ahead and get started with this afternoon's webinar. Um, I am Tim Spann. I fill the role as the Research Program Director for the California Avocado Commission. And today we are going to have Dr. Carol Lovett from the University of California, Riverside with us and Dr. Jonathan Dixon, an avocado consultant from New Zealand and former California Avocado Commission Research Program Director with us. Um, the genesis of this webinar came about when Ken Melvin and myself uh, were on a call with Jonathan about actually some unrelated topics and, and we were just talking about the state of the industry, the avocado industry in New Zealand. And Jonathan shared with us that, you know, some new regulations are coming upon agriculture in New Zealand um, that have to do with, with nitrogen restrictions, uh, particularly as a result of the dairy industry in that country. Um, and some of you may not know, but a lot of those same similar regulations are being put upon us in California as well, um, specifically on the central coast with Ag Order 4.0, uh, which is putting restrictions on the amount of nitrogen that growers will be allowed to use. Um, that, that particular order doesn't impact a lot of avocado growers. It, it um, hits San Luis Obispo County, um, a few growers there, but the bulk of our industry is still out of those kinds of regulations. Um, but it's probably coming for everybody um, in California, all growers of all crops um, in the very near future. And so we thought it would be good to have Jonathan kind of share with you what their industry is dealing with in New Zealand, how growers are managing with, with restrictions put on them for nitrogen use. And then we'll have Dr. Carol Lovett follow Jonathan and review the research that she has done over the years on the proper amount of nitrogen for fertility for avocados in California and the proper timing of that fertilization. So with that, I will turn it over to Jonathan and he will share his screen. Um, if you do have questions, please enter them in the Q&A box. Uh, so if you kind of go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A box. You can type your question in there. When each of the speakers is finished, um, I will read those questions and allow them to have time to answer the questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Tim. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be talking to the California avocado industry again after a, a quite a few years. Uh, my talk is really going to be in two parts. One is, um, I try and look at this whole topic from the point of view of the grower. And um, I'll leave it up to Carol to give us all good oil on the science um, behind it. But what I've really got for you is, is how I look at fertilizing avocados and fertilizer programs, um, what's happening with the nitrogen restrictions uh, being imposed uh, on agriculture in New Zealand, um, which are not quite as dire as they first look, but um, you know the most frightening thing to hear is, "Hi, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help," and that's pretty much what's going on um, over here. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, nitrogen budgeting and um, what you can do as a grower in terms of assessing your nitrogen use and um, what your leaching potential is from your uh, groves. So this uh, first uh, picture up here is um, what I, it's for trees in New Zealand, and I look at this picture and, and immediately think, these trees are hungry. They need some nitrogen, they're a bit too yellow. Um, I'd rather they were much darker green. Just to let you know, let's see if this thing, But screen won't go forward for me at the moment, Tim. Mm. Ah, yeah, the mouse will do it. I am familiar with uh, avocado trees in California. Um, this is probably not a great example, um, 
but you can see the chloride toxicity um, and damage on the leaves and uh, the general color. And, and really, in my, I've visited California quite a few times. And really, when I walk groves, one of the things that is always in the back of my mind is, what is what are you doing with your fertilizer programs? Because trees always look really hungry to me. And I do wonder if it's not affecting your productivity in terms of uh, yields. So um, <clears throat> the way I approach the fertilizer recommendations is that avocado orchard management, it's a complex interaction of a number of activities. So if you just focus on one thing, um, that's really not where you live as a grower. As a grower, you're living in a space where you're looking at lots of different things. And all of these things sort of interact with each other and um, you need to get them all right for you to get the best outcome. So for me, if you were to boil it down to three key things that you absolutely have to do, it's irrigation, pruning, and your fertilizer applications. And so I want to talk about how do I determine the fertilizer program. And um, as I said, we'll talk about nitrogen. So I think it's fair to say that average yields in California are typically low in, in avocados, and it's definitely unsustainable in the long term. And what's really interesting is there's been no real change in these yields for a very long time. And if you look at other high value fruit crops, over the last 20 or 30 years, their yields have been climbing. Even if the poor old grower is, is not making any more money, effectively stand, you know, running to stand still, avocados are sort of bucking the trend in that we're finding it quite difficult to get yields up into the sort of like 20,000 pounds an acre uh, range, which is probably where you guys need to be to get your economic sustainability up. Part of that, I think, is that um, as a grower, you need to, if you're wanting to get high yields, you've got to get your nutrition right. And um, my approach has been to know and understand the research and um, that includes Carol's research, even though I'm applying some of her outcomes in New Zealand. And my philosophy is to match the fertilizer applications to the tree growth cycle. And so this allows for better targeted fertilizer applications, type of fertilizer, and uh, the timing of it. But what we do lack is tools that tell us we've got it right. So pretty much we put fertilizer on and we hope we've got it, we've done the job well and done it right. And I don't have tools that tell me that we have, we have done it right. So um, we've got to bear in mind that um, when we look at any of the nutrients we put on, um, we put it on and we hope that that will work particularly well. So I went back to first principles, um, identify key growth stages, uh, identified the best type of growth to target. Uh, by that, I mean, what kind of flowering wood do you, do you need? Um, should it be summer growth, that sort of thing? Identifying uh, variation in the growth and yield. So you can actually look at your trees and say, did it work? And on the database that I have of soil and leaf testing and yields, I've used um, the same statistical methods as the decision support tool. Uh, used to determine uh, targets for um, leaf test and yields. And they're surprisingly similar to, when you do it that way, to the um, values that the decision support tool uh, gives you. The other thing is to understand the tree. So as a, as a farmer, you know, as I said before, you're not living in isolation when you do any activity on your, um, on your grove. We also have to understand that the nature of the avocado tree is it's, it's an evergreen. It's certainly has as high vigor. It can carry two crops at once. It flowers on one year old wood and that shoot bud break through to having a piece of fruit on that shoot is a two year process. We've also got to bear in mind that we've got soil chemistry and microbiology so uh, in, in there. So, in particular, over in New Zealand, we have acidic soils. So 
pH is a, is a big deal um, for us because we can easily get very um, low pHs. What kind of fertilizers are you using? Are you using inorganic or organic fertilizers? What's the actual program? And are you looking to break alternate bearing? And um, again, I so just emphasize that I work on the fact that I'm not doing anything in isolation when I'm thinking about a fertilized program. And crop load is one of those areas that uh, I use as one of the foundations of um, understanding how much fertilizer uh, that should be being put on the growth. Probably not going to dwell on this very much, but um, we put this together quite a few years ago now. Um, but what I want to do with this is just to illustrate to you that all the different years are connected. So we have on crops and off crops and we have um, different strengths of on crops and off crops. So you might have a year where you've got virtually no fruit. You might have a year when you've got a hu huge, huge crop, um, but they're all part and parcel of the same um, basic alternate bearing cycle that sort of underlies the tree. And what this um, chart does is sort of try to illustrate what's happening with the tree when you're going from a small crop through to a large crop in terms of how much um, shoot growth you're getting, how much flowering are you getting and so on. And so by understanding this uh, process, you can start to see where your fertilizer timing makes sense and um, where you want to be promoting, um, say, shoot flush and where you don't want to be promoting shoot flush. Uh, and so what I would um, suggest is that, uh, I'm not sure if that, how available this is, but to get it and have a read of it and see if you can um, really understand what it means from year to year in terms of what the tree is doing, because fertilizer has a big impact um, on how the tree grows and what you can be doing to adjusting that growth. Um, now, bear in mind, fertilizer is only one thing. Pruning is the other thing that is sort of a major, has a major impact on what's going on with the tree. So I've, um, for me, have broken down key times in the um, tree growth cycle. That's uh, flowering, shoot flush, um, so spring flush and summer flush in New Zealand are considered uh, to be a good fruit set potential wood. The studies I've seen in California suggest that summer flush, that's the primary source of your fruit set. Then there's fruit set itself, um, the fruit growth. So that initial um, fruit growth period is certainly very important. Uh, root growth, and to bear in mind that most of those things I've just mentioned are all happening around the same time. So the tree has, quite a demand for nutrients over, over that time, and that time is spring, of course. Then there's another time, um, which for us is, and I guess it's for you guys as well, uh, is the sort of late summer, early fall, where the trees are basically deciding how many flowers they're going to make for the next year. And that process continues um, probably through to November, I would say in some of your groves. Um, the other key area for us is uh, leaf function in winter. So what do I mean by that? What we know from measuring photosynthesis in, in leaves of our trees over winter is that they are photosynthetically active to quite a high degree. And this is the time we can um, build up carbohydrates in the tree, which support the next flowering. So by making sure our leaves are in good condition um, and well supported with a good nutrient program, um, we then figure that we're going to be on the positive side of the ledger when it comes to flowering and the tree has a great fruit set potential. So that means putting fertilizer on over winter. And um, I came to that conclusion because um, we measured root growth 
over winter and we found that we could get new roots growing in the winter months and um, that told me that the, the roots themselves were probably active and that if we put fertilizer on then we would actually get it in the tree. The other thing is that it's very noticeable that when we have high yielding um, groves they need a high nutrient input just to stand still. So if we don't put enough nutrients in, we don't get growth out of the trees, which means we don't get flowering wood for the following year. So the program I have, um, it's constantly evolving uh, as we get new research. Um, in my opinion, uh, it appears that nutrients are allocated first to mature fruit, then flowers and the new fruit set, then new shoots and then finally roots. And that's the observation that when we get into say an on flowering uh, or an off flowering, um, what tends to happen with the tree? You get uh, one, uh, an off flowering, you get a lot of shoot growth um, out of there. If, it, if it's an on flowering and we get a lot of fruit set, we get very little shoot growth. So what it says to me is that the nutrient uptake in those um, periods, um, we're not giving enough to the tree to get it to a point where it can do all of the things it needs to do to get you going for the um, for consistent cropping. So um, the program I put out now is in fact in two parts. I have a fall, winter and spring program. It's based on crop estimate and soil and leaf test results. Um, so it's primarily a function of how much fruit the tree is carrying. Not, I'm not looking at how much vigor is on the tree, etc. Uh, and then in the summer program is the second part, and that's based on the new fruit set. And the reason I did it this way was that I used to do an annual program, and the annual program, if we had a heavy crop on the trees and then set a light crop, we were still fertilizing as if we had a heavy crop, which made no sense. So the program goes in, in two parts. And um, pretty much everybody here puts lime on, and that's usually done in late summer, um, bearing in mind that we get late summer, we get summer rainfall. So we get a lot more rain than you guys do. So, um, and uh, lime in late summer is more, it's more a convenience thing because most people have harvested by then and um, it's a lot easier to get the uh, contractor in to spread lime at that time of year than it is at any other time of year. So how much to apply? Um, my approach is to meet leaf nutrient targets. Um, soil's important. But being an evergreen subtropical tropical tree, I look at the leaf more than I do at the soil. Um, because I think we're not dealing with a deciduous tree that drops all its leaves and you know, has a very clear um, cycle of dormancy. The, in, in our view, avocado trees don't have a dormancy period. They get cold, which means they slow down, but they don't actually stop. Um, also looking at crop load. So the more fruit you have, the more fertilizer you need. So if you starve your trees when you've got a good crop load on there, you're setting yourself up, in our view, to fail the following year. Um, we, do, we don't irrigate very much, except in the north of the country where it's on sand. Um, so we're doing soil-based applications of solid fertilizer. Um, I also look at, um, and this is where Carol's research was very helpful, is looking at the nutrient partitioning within the tree. Um, but that basically we wanna know how much is the, going into the fruit, how much goes into the tree and how much won't go into anything. And then we need to look at the size of the tree. So that's what I mean by number of trees that you want um, on the orchard, but also we tend to work in averages when it comes to fertilizer. And um, an average by definition means half your trees are going to be above a target and half are going to be below the target. 
Whereas as a farmer, I think we want 95% or 19 out of 20 trees to be above the target, 95% or one in 20 to be below the target. So that actually influences how much um, fertilizer you would put on. And then the other thing is walk your grove, look at your trees and be prepared to change if things aren't working. So this is an example of uh, a low yielding um, grove that uh, I would put together this, I put together this year. I apologize if it's reading kilograms per tree or kilograms per hectare. Um, but really what I want to show in this, this program, it's roughly a 5,000 pound per acre um, producing grove is I've got there May, um, June, July, August is our winter. September, October, November is our spring. And you can see that we do monthly applications and it varies month by month. Um, and then I have just different individual types of um, fertilizer there. Some are there for some phosphate, there's potassium, there's calcium, there's uh, magnesium, and a little bit of trace elements. Most of our growers would actually use a blended fertilizer rather than individual um, ones, but I don't think you guys would have access to those blended fertilizers over in California. Um, but you'll notice the table at the bottom with the red circle. So this is what I've been introducing um, is a calculation of how much elemental nitrogen, um, phosphorus and potassium that is being uh, in the program to be added to the, the grove in a year. And um, that's been um, necessary because we want to be prepared for when we come under the gun for the amount of nitrogen we're using on our groves, but also the gap systems are demanding now that we have uh, fertilizer diaries and we account for how much fertilizer we're putting on the, the soil. Um, just to give you a quick contrast, here's an example of a program for a high yielding. Uh, block that's um, these are genuine uh, these are off genuine fertilizer recommendations for this year. Uh, I do about 150 recommendations a year so uh, I have a bit of a range so it's about a 27,000 pound uh, per acre crop so I will say that's a pretty good crop uh, even by our standards and um, you'll see very much the same program in terms of the timing and um, the amounts are just increased based on the crop load. Um, but you'll see again there that the previous one had about 70 kilos of nitrogen um, per hectare, even though we're now talking what five times, six times the am amount of crop. I'm not talking about five or six times the amount of nitrogen uh, on the tree, but it is a substantial um, increase. And I find that if we don't do this, what we tend to get is a lot of nitrogen deficiency symptoms or what I consider nitrogen deficiency symptoms, which is things like premature leaf drop, um, poor fruit growth, um, trees struggle to regrow and put on a new flush. So um, well, getting on to this, um, as a, as a country, or I suppose as an ag industry, there's, there's a, a big focus on sustainability. Um, it's like someone's turned a switch on and said, hey, we have to pay attention to things like carbon footprints and um, nitrogen fertilizer, in particular nitrate um, and its excessive use. And I think unfortunately, nitrogen fertilizer has become something of a bogeyman in terms of um, looking at it in agriculture as excessive use certainly can result in leaching of nitrate and lead to poor outcomes in waterways. So one of the things that's been quite disturbing is um, seeing in some areas of New Zealand where it used to be when I was a kid last century uh, that you could go to a river and you could swim in that river and it was clean and you wouldn't get sick from swimming in it, you wouldn't get any uh, bugs, etc. Nowadays, 
most of the rivers have got so much um, pollution in them that you wouldn't dare swim in them anymore. And so that's really what got the government to sit up and take notice and say, we'll put in this healthy waterways initiative. And basically they targeted the dairy industry. Now dairy in New Zealand is really big uh, as a percentage of our ag. Um, and we're one of the biggest exporters of dairy around the world. Um, and what has happened is that there's been a lot of intensification and new areas of um, the country opened up to dairying. And what it's resulted in is an eightfold increase in nitrogen applications to pasture lands. And um, this can be as much as 400 kilograms of elemental nitrogen a hectare um, annually. And so you can imagine that uh, amount of leaching is going on with. Um, with the amount of nitrogen that's being used there. So in their wisdom, um, the government has capped synthetic nitrogen applications at 170 pounds an acre per year. So that's a calculation from 190 kilos per hectare. And unfortunately, this figure is being chucked around as uh, something that everybody in ag should be aspiring to. And um, I don't think if you read the legislation, they really are intending that to be the case. But we know that when um, these things get put in place, it's the thin end of the wedge. And um, so it's only for pasture at present, but it's being left up to the local authorities to police. And most of these people, of course, are not um, qualified in ag and stuff who are doing the policing. So it's an awful lot simpler for them just to come up with a line in the sand and say, this is the number you can't exceed. So the kiwi fruit industry in New Zealand through Zespri have um, paid a lot of attention to this because they're thinking to move, uh, to be for uh, front footing this and saying for the kiwi, um, we're going to intensively um, monitor and understand how much nitrogen we're using and we're with the aim to cut it back, uh, obviously without trying to cut back on productivity. Unfortunately for avocados, um, certainly in, in the New Zealand context, we have very little information that gives us um, knowledge that we can go and argue back with the authorities to say, hey, this number is um, not sensible or this, this number will affect productivity. So I've been starting to get some measurements and get some understanding of just what is um, going on with the nitrogen in our soils and how much are we uh, applying. But um, really it's, it's come about um, from polluted waterways and an inability really for a number of people in the dairy industry to, to not um, cut back on their nitrogen use and um, prevent these sort of problems from happening. I remember when I was in California that uh, it was before Tim's time, uh, maybe before Ken's time, that we went to the Central Valley and went to a meeting up there where they were talking about nitrate in the aquifer up in the, in the Central Valley there. And unfortunately, as avocado growers, I think you're going to be hit with the legacy of what was done in the past. Because it takes quite a long time for the nitrate to percolate down into the aquifers and then show up in people's wells and stuff. I think uh, the other thing in California too is I think you have natural nitrate um, level coming out of your um, rocks and things so that some of your water has naturally got nitrate in it anyway. Um, and uh, that's not because of ag use. So as an outcome of this, um, what we're looking at is we're putting um, emphasis on understanding um, the use of nitrogen. I think we need it for high yields in avocados. Um, I base my programs, as I, I said, on um, the, the fruit set and, and the amount of fruit on the tree. I'm not focused on shoot growth per se. What I'm aiming for is shoot growth, but that's not the measurement I'm using to say how much should I put on. 
Um, and certainly we need to adjust the amount of nitrogen fertilizer we use when the yields are different. So if you have a low yield, you need a low amount. And if you've need got a high yield, you need a high amount. Um, uh, the term we sort of use is to drive the tree's shoot growth. So pruning is one of the tools we use for that, but the fertilizer application is the other um, one. Uh, New Zealand has a cooler climate than California and our growth flushes tend to be truncated. So in other words, they tend to be cut off. They don't tend to go as long, but we have very high vigor because we've got lots of rain and um, our trees are growing in really good volcanic soils, um, very similar soils to those of Mexico. So um, we, in my observation too, and I mean, this is just an opinion of mine, um, that when I go and visit other countries growing avocados around the world, um, they're a lot hotter than New Zealand. And I feel that heat drives growth as much as nitrogen does. And um, so you don't actually need as much nitrogen to get the same amount of vigor as we do uh, out of your trees. But you must ensure, if you're in a hotter climate, you must ensure that trees are well watered to take advantage of, of that. And the, uh, the other thing is, if you only think about nitrogen as affecting shoot growth, I don't think that's correct way to look at it. There are other nutrients um, and there are other aspects of the tree, like I mentioned before about where are you in an alternate bearing cycle? Um, what are your plant growth regulators doing? All of that sort of um, side of things. So this is an example um, of a tree that I consider to, to have been nitrogen deficient really when it flowered. Um, this is what I consider low yielding because the fruit's quite small, most of that's gonna fall off. Uh, but you can see the leaf's gone. And so the tree is going to have to grow new leaf and everything again. And the tree pays a price for that. And it's gotta come out of its nutrient budget. Likewise, this tree here has set a really good crop. And again, um, I see this as, as having had some nitrogen deficiency as well. It's a very determinate flowering tree, um, but there is literally no growth on that tree at all. And, or no new growth, I should say, on this tree at all. And that's what I'm using nitrogen for, is to um, account for that, that this tree won't set any fruit next year, because if it does grow, it's gonna grow really late. Um, and it's going to pull its carbohydrate reserves right down to, to hardly anything. So its flowering potential the next year is not good. I know a lot of growers would look at this tree and go, yippee, um, this is fantastic. But you've got to remember then that the crop on this tree has got to last you for two years economically. So um, it's not the best situation to be in. So how would you go about um, assessing your, your nitrogen? Um, so really, um, we, we apply two, two basic forms, and I'm not gonna talk about urea because in our situation, we don't really apply urea. Um, we either apply ammonium or, or nitrate. Um, Ammonium is held more strongly in the soil than nitrate. It's got a positive charge and um, nitrate's got a negative charge. The thing is plants really like nitrate. That's, that's their favorite thing to take up, but it also leaches quite easily. Um, ammonium is converted to nitrate by soil life. So whatever affects the soil life, uh, like temperature and soil moisture and stuff will affect how readily that ammonium is converted to, to nitrate. The um, nitrogen balance um, in your grove, there are lots of, this is a very, just a very terse um, list. Um, there are lots of fancy diagrams showing you nitrogen cycling and so on, which you can look up on the internet um, and show how things all work together. 
but basically you get a little bit of nit um, nitrate coming in um, from rainfall, some from nitrogen fixing plants, but you've got to bear in mind with nitrogen fixing plants, they are going to really only fix nitrogen if they are in a nitrogen deficient situation. If they are where you're putting fertilizer on, they're very unlikely to be fixing nitrogen because they don't need to. Um, we also get it from decomposing organic matter um, and, and the soil micro mixture. So our soils contain about seven to 14% organic matter. Um, so these are these sort of rich volcanic type soils. I think um, the soils in California, you wouldn't have anywhere close to that level of, of organic matter in most of your groves. Um, and then obviously the biggest input of nitrogen is going to be synthetic fertilizer. Your outputs are your ammonium volatilization and denitrification. That's also carried out by microbes. What's being fixed into organic matter, um, what the plant takes up, and then whatever is left is leaching. Um, and so how could you estimate your nitrogen leaching? Um, so the most the nitrate that gets below your root zone is the stuff that's really lost the most easily. And it really depends on how much is there and how much water is draining from the soil. So if you've got salty water and you need to be irrigating and you need to run a sort of a, a leaching um, run because you need to sort of get your salt down, uh, you're going to leach nitrate. You just can't, you can't avoid it. Um, we typically lose, um, it's been measured of something like four to 20% of the nitrate in the soil um, on, on our um, orchards. Uh, and I mean, there are a lot of models around that you can calculate nitrate losses of, um, but they really require specific information for your own soil and your, your own climate um, in terms of exactly what your the amounts that you would lose through your soil. So um, over here, we're just working with some very simple balance sheets. I've just put it in pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, you can work out roughly what your, your leaching risk is. Um, you can, basically it's fertilizer diary. So you add in all the fertilizer you apply, if you're putting any compost on or any organic matter, um, in your orchard and then you look at what are you removing in the fruit and what are you removing uh, does the tree take up and maybe if you've got weeds or cover crops or something like that what are they taking up and then the difference between the two is what's potentially available to be uh, leached out so as a as a grower you can sit down and work out on the back of an envelope or you know, on a spreadsheet if you like uh, how much um, nitrogen you're putting in and how much is potentially coming out. Um, and I think um, some of Carol's research has got some great results uh, there that you can help you uh, look at the removal. I just want to quickly run through this one. This is the kind of fertilizers that we, we use and the amounts of nitrogen uh, in them. They're primarily uh, either solid fertilizers or foliars. Foliars work really well for us. So we, we find foliar fertilizer um, very effective. Um, but just to whatever fertilizer you're using is to make sure you understand how much nitrogen is in that fertilizer. And then is there a nitrate to ammonium ratio there? Because uh, it's the nitrate that is, is the one you really, is really gonna move on you quickly. Um, where we have some of these more organic things like um, fish meal or blood and bone and stuff, then um, they don't tend to have readily sort of measurable things like nitrate and ammonium in them, but they are, they can be a significant um, addition of nitrogen into your system. Um, we would only use the urea down there. Um, we've got at the bottom of the table, got tech, low biurea, that um, is uh, probably the only urea most people would ever use. And that would be put on as a 1% urea spray, um, usually over winter. 
What's probably of more interest is, is to look at um, organic manures in terms of where is the nitrogen um, in these organic manures. Um, we tend to put on um, quite a bit of compost um, or we could put on quite a bit of uh, maybe green waste. Um, and depending on what you've got there, um, on a per sort of pound basis, they don't have a lot of nitrogen uh, in them, but we add them in tons. So, you know, you might put 10 tons uh, on a hectare. Well, 10 tons is, starts to get up there in terms of how much nitrogen you're putting into the system. It's not readily available in, as immediately as something like nitrate is, uh, but it's still filling up the system. And um, so it still leads to potential leaching. And you'll see right at the bottom of the table there, I've got bark. Um, bark we use as a mulch. The idea is it does not break down. So it's not really contributing to the nitrogen mix. It also is probably soaking up nitrogen in the system. And I'll put sawdust in there, which no one should ever put on there around their avocado trees. Um, but it's there to just provoke a bit of thought that if you do have excessive amounts of nitrogen, whether or not something that will soak up nitrogen would actually be of value to you in your, in your grove. Um, the other, yeah, so mentioned that last. So when um, what we're encouraging our growers to do is to come up with a nutrient plan. And that is to go and review your historical nitrogen use and look at your cropping history and your estimated crop because nitrogen use may be that you're not using enough as much as you could have been using uh, more. Uh, what is the history of your soil and leaf tests? And then in the soil, we're looking at things like what we call potentially available nitrogen, sometimes called anaerobically mineralizable nitrogen, organic matter, hot water nitrogen, um, and microbe analysis, because um, what this does is it helps us understand how much nitrogen is, is present and is easily available. And the organic matter tells us, you know, what potential release we've got. And by looking at these things, we can understand the long-term trends, but also think about how will the soil actually react to addition of nitrogen in there? Will it all just um, soak it up or will it leach it um, and so on? So we're encouraging our growers to think about um, having a nutrient plan and seeing what that actually means. So reducing nitrate, um, leaching risk um, for us, our three top factors are light free draining soil. So we have some avocado um, growing regions for us are on consolidated sand dunes. So the soil is literally sand um, and extremely free draining. So you can imagine it's, it's not gonna hold very much at all. Where you have waterlogged, heavy soils, heavy rainfall, um, you, you're not getting great organic matter, you're not getting great microbial life, you're not getting great turnover and whether or not there's a high surplus um, nitrogen application. So we routinely use little and often applications. So you'll have seen in those fertilizer um, programs that I put up that um, we're putting something on monthly, but we're not putting great big lumps of fertilizer on every three months or, or whatever. Um, the idea behind that is um, we're just trying to put on the amount of nitrogen we think the tree will use in that month uh, and try and judge it so that we're not putting on more than is required. Um, people are being encouraged to test an area on their groves to see if they could reduce their nitrogen use and see if that makes any effect. Um, pretty scary for me because you know if it's if it's wrong um, you're going to lose out quite a lot. Um, the, the other thing that stuff probably people already know, um, which is, you know, don't put your nitrogen on and then heavily irrigate. Put, put your nitrogen on last or at the end of an irrigation. So it's, it's there in the root zone. And the other thing to do is to make sure you go out, read your trees and look for signs of nitrogen deficiency. 
Um, it's not the severe deficiency that you'd be looking for. You're looking for the subtle stuff that um, is telling you that the trees are a bit hungry and need a bit of support. So I'm nearly there. Um, so from, from my point of view, I, I don't think nitrogen's a bogeyman. I think it's, it's misunderstood. I think um, it's absolutely necessary for high yielding um, groves. Uh, and I, as I said at the beginning, I do wonder um, at times when I've walked around just how much fertilizer is going on the, on the groves relative to the desire for um, achieving high yields. Um, there is some research, I think, out of Israel that talked about nitrate may help with chloride tolerance. I don't know where that research has got to or whether everyone agrees with it or not. Um, so nitrate itself is, it is useful. And we're experimenting um, with cover crops, um, which can reduce excessive nitrogen um, and, and increase the organic nitrogen in, in the pool. So one particular plant um, that uh, has been fun to, to be working with is sunflowers, is planting sunflowers down um, between the rows of trees. Um, the, the advantage of sunflowers is that um, we seem to get a big boost in bumblebee populations when we have sunflowers. So, um, and they put out a big deep tap root. So you cut them down and you're getting, you know, organic matter getting pushed deeper into the soil. Um, and we're then putting the nitrogen into the organic pool for cycling. And so this last slide is really what I'm looking to achieve. So this is what I consider this is, this is the gold standard. This is what I want our trees to look like when we're flowering. Good, high quality, overwintered leaves, sitting there photosynthesizing away, supporting the new shoot growth, supporting the flowering. Um, and then we have a good amount of growth that's coming forward. Um, so that's going to be our flowering wood for the following season. So um, that's me. All right, thank you, Jonathan. So we have one question in the Q&A chat box. Um, before I read that, I'll just remind everybody, if, if you do have a question for, for Jonathan or during Carol's uh, talk, please enter it in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll, we'll read through those and answer them at the end of each talk. Um, so the one question we have right now, Jonathan, is how many trees per hectare are average in New Zealand? Um, like many things, it, it depends. Um, so the traditional spacing is um, seven meters by seven meters for Hass. So what's that? Twenty-one feet. Yeah. Sort of Twenty. Approximately. Sort of, um, and then um, the trees get thinned out so that that spacing increases over time. So initially, it works out about one hundred and seventy-four trees per hectare. So I apologize if that's um, doesn't make sense on a per acre. Um, and uh, so that's where they start out. A lot of people now are planting higher density um, and some of these spacings are probably uh, two meters, that's six foot six uh, apart, three meters, which is sort of 12, 14 feet uh, apart. And um, most new plantings now would be at those higher densities. So when it comes to fertilizer, you, you know, I tend to work off a per hectare rate or a per acre rate to start with, and then divide that up amongst the trees. Um, because tree size, you know, a great big tree will need more fertilizer than a little tiny tree. Uh, common sense just tells us that. Okay, we have one other question that came in. Do you adjust your nitrogen application if applying gibberellic acid to your trees? Um, we don't apply gibberellic acid as a rule. I am experimenting with it on gems um, to actually suppress the flowering on gem. 
so, um, but because uh, it's not applied, what is applied um, quite heavily is um, uh, sunny uniconazole or plactibutrazole. Um, and people tend not to adjust their nitrogen on that. So um, when they really should, uh, and so you can walk on some of those groves and they, the trees are literally black. The, the leaves are so green, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, but as I said, by focusing, um, we focus on the crop load primarily, but we don't use gibberellic acid um, as a rule. Not that we couldn't. Okay, and one more question. Are most groves on hillsides or flat? A uh, great majority is what you guys would call flat flat country. Um, there are some growing on slopes, but um, the maximum allowable slopes for the machinery we use is about is a 20 degree slope. So most people would be growing on less than a 20 degree slope. Okay, that's all the questions we have for right now. So Carol, we will turn it over to you. If you want to start screen sharing. Well, good morning, New Zealand, and good afternoon, California. Um, before I begin, uh, um, for some reason, I can't advance my slides. I think you just have to use the mouse, Carol. Uh, I am, and it's not ready. There we go. Something raised. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank Tim and Jonathan for inviting me to participate in the discussion today on nitrogen fertilization of the Haas avocado. And I think after watching Jonathan's presentation, we have been reinforced in the idea of how big the trees are in New Zealand relative to the size of the Haas avocado tree grown in California. And that has an impact on yield. So in my presentation today to present information important to California growers, I'm going to give information that's specific to them. But I'm also going to present um, basic principles that apply to uh, avocado production in New Zealand and California and virtually any place that avocados are grown. So I'm going to start by um, giving a, a very obvious statement. There we go. The goal of avocado growers is to increase net profit in an era of ever increasing production costs. Now to do this, growers must maximize the yield of high quality, commercially valuable sized fruit. And this requires the growers to maintain production at the total yield that results in the maximum yield of commercially valuable sized fruit on an annual basis. So a cost-effective strategy for increasing yield, fruit size, fruit quality, and net, net income is to optimize tree nutrient status along with proper irrigation and maintaining good tree health. Now, I want to remind you that plant growth regulators, and we do have the use of gibberellic acid, In, I was trying to remove the screen share sign, sorry. We do have the use of gibberellic acid in California now. Plant growth regulators produce the best results when nutrition is optimal, irrigation is optimal, and the tree is healthy. So plant growth regulators can do great things, but they cannot fully compensate for a poorly managed orchard. Now the first thing that a grower has to do is to identify the commercially valuable sized fruit for its target market. The majority of growers in California try to achieve maximum yield of 48. These are fruit that are 213 
to 269 grams per fruit. And we are very fortunate in California that yield peaks on 48s. So fruit size distribution is basically a bell curve, and typically in California, 48s would be somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the total yield. Larger fruit, 270 to 325 grams per fruit, would be somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the total yield. With smaller size fruit, 178 to 212 grams per fruit, another 20 to 25 percent of total yield. The very small fruit, less than 178 grams per fruit, are about 10 percent of total yield and the very large fruit, greater than 325 grams per fruit, are about 10% of total yield. Now in this figure, I'm going to show you the total yield per tree that results in maximum yield of commercially valuable sized fruit in California. This, is a, this data in this figure come from a data set that I collected over a 20 year period in multiple orchards in eight different growing areas in California. So the data set had approximately 3,000 trees for which I had total yield, pack out, and leaf analyses. Now this is a complex figure, but I'm going to walk you through it. And the very first thing is you can ignore the green bars. I want to direct your attention to the x-axis along the bottom of the figure, which is total yield in kilograms per tree. So the first bin is 0 to 10 kilograms per tree total yield. The second bin is more than 10 kilograms up to 20 kilograms total yield per tree. And the third bin is greater than 20 kilograms up to 30 kilograms per tree. And so it goes all the way across to 230 kilograms per tree. And yes, Virginia, there are trees in California that produce 230 kilograms per tree. And if we could have an orchard of them, we could produce 62.5 metric tons per hectare. Now, the thing I want to confirm for you is that our yield does peak on packing carton size 48. Fruit there are 213 to 269 grams per fruit. These are the black squares. The second thing I want you to see is that the yield of commercially valuable size fruit increases as yield, total yield per tree increases up to 95 kilograms per tree. That's the equivalent of 210 pounds per tree. Once yield exceeds this level of production, we see that 60s and 70s dominate yield until 70s are basically the majority of fruit that the trees are producing. So at 210 pounds per tree, that's 23,000 pounds per 110 trees per acre. Now, in all the data that I present expressed per acre, it's based on 110 trees per acre, which is the standard we use to report yield to the California Avocado Commission. That is equivalent to 272 trees per hectare. So whenever I report yield data or nitrogen levels per hectare, it's based on 272 trees per hectare. So by giving you the planting density and knowing your own planting density, you can estimate the kinds of yields and rates of nitrogen you would need. So the equivalent of 210 pounds per acre is 95 kilograms per tree, which is 25,800 kilograms per hectare. Now at these yields, the yield of commercially valuable sized fruit is 70 pounds per tree, or 7,700 pounds per acre. The equivalent is 31 kilograms per tree, or 8,624 kilograms per hectare. 
But I can tell you that 210 pounds per tree, or 95 kilograms per tree, is way higher than the current yield in California. Presently, the yield is 62 pounds per tree, which is 6,800 pounds per acre. The equivalent is 28 kilograms per tree, or 7,621 kilograms per hectare. Okay, now we can look at the green bars. The green bars tell you the number of trees producing a specific yield. So this first bar tells you more than 600 trees out of my 3,000 tree data set produced zero to 10 kilograms per tree. So one fifth of the trees in that data set produced 10 or less kilograms per tree. The second bar shows you that 325 trees in that data set produce more than 10 kilograms per tree, up to 20 kilograms per tree. So approximately 1,000 trees, one third of that data set had trees producing 20 kilograms per tree or less. Now I wanna make it abundantly clear this is not due to the California avocado grower. This is due to the conditions under which we are trying to produce avocados in California. California is very hot and it's getting hotter with climate change. There are periods, hours during the day in the summer and into the early fall, September, where the trees are not able to photosynthesize. Stomates are closed, and photosynthesis is not taking place. And this goes on for multiple days. So that reduces the amount of carbohydrate that's available for tree growth. In addition, we have periods of excessively high temperature. We have periods uh, last year where the temperature was 116 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 46.7 degrees Celsius, and that lasted for three days. And what that did was to cause the fruit to excise from the tree, and that initiates alternate bearing. So what you're looking at over here is the off trees, the off crop years. And these are the on crop years. And I verified that by looking at the individual trees that are represented here and documenting that they had high yields the following year. They are not unhealthy trees. Now the other thing is that we have to irrigate our trees and a lot of growers do not have access to adequate amounts of high quality water. Some of our growers still get their water every two weeks, whether they need it or not. And most of the time, they needed it sooner than two weeks. A lot of our growers are having to use low quality water, which is uh, high in salinity. And one of the first pictures that Jonathan showed you was the damage that results on an avocado tree due to salinity and that further reduces photosynthesis because those dark brown areas cannot photosynthesize. Now, California may be hot, but we still have freezes and we have snow. Ask Tim Spann about the snow. And so those low temperatures kill the floral buds as well as damaging the mature food on the tree. And so bloom the following year is reduced and that initiates alternate bearing. Now, in the current yield at 62 pounds per tree, or 28 kilograms per tree, 48s represent 2,530 pounds per acre, or 2,834 kilograms per acre, acre. The goal in California is to increase productivity to 10,000 pounds per acre. This is the goal of the California Avocado Commission to help the growers achieve this. That means that each of those 110 trees has to produce approximately 91 pounds per tree. That's 30 more pounds than they're producing now. The equivalent would be 
11,200 kilograms for 272 trees per hectare, with each tree producing 41 kilograms per tree. Now, if we can achieve this goal, it would increase the yield of 48s to 4,180 pounds per acre, or 4,682 kilograms uh, per hectare. This is a net increase of 1,650 pounds per acre, or 1,848 kilograms per hectare. So that is potentially a significant increase in net profit to the grower. Now, I want to assure you that when you increase the yield to 10,000 pounds per acre, or 11,000 kilograms per hectare, you're not swamping your tree with small fruit. We see that we have the maximum yield of 48, fruit that weigh 213 to 269 grams per fruit, and they represent 39% of the total yield. Larger fruit would represent 18% of the total yield with fruit larger than 325 grams per fruit, only 10% of the total yield. Smaller size fruit, 178 to 212 grams per fruit, would be about 24% of the total yield, with fruit smaller than 178 grams per fruit, only 10% of the total yield. How much nitrogen would be required to produce 10,000 pounds per acre, or 11,200 kilograms per hectare, in order to increase the yield of commercially valuable sized fruit? This is an estimated nitrogen requirement based on tree dissection studies, or as Jonathan referred to them, tree partitioning studies. That's a much better term. But what we basically did in two studies that were done in California was excavate whole trees from the soil and dissect the tree into its basic components. And we did this on uh, every other month basis. So we had the inflorescences, we have new shoot growth, we have leaves, we have developing fruit over time, the mature fruit. We divided the cyan trunk and the rootstock trunk, large roots, small roots, root hairs, and also scaffold branches, uh, smaller branches, and even smaller branches until we were to the green shoots on the tree. And then we analyzed the nutrient content of each of these sections of the tree. So these two studies, were one, the first was done by my lab in the late 1990s, and we published a grower-friendly article in AVA Research with Guy Whitney in 2001. The second study was led by Richard Rosecrantz from California State University, Chico, and Ben Faber and I participated in that project. So for 10,000 pounds per acre, we have a range of 41.5 to 44 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Equivalently, for 11,200 kilograms per hectare, you would require 46.5 to 49 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So I simply averaged these values because they're not very different. And so we get 43 pounds of nitrogen per acre to produce 10,000 pounds of fruit per acre, and 48 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare to produce 11,200 kilograms of fruit per hectare. And then I simply calculated the amount of nitrogen to produce 1,000 pounds of fruit per acre, and that's 4.3 pounds of nitrogen per acre, so that we could multiply the crop load by the nitrogen requirement and adjust the nitrogen for the different yields on the tree. And I did the same thing for the metric presentation, but I made it 1,000 kilograms per hectare, and that value rounded off is also 4.3 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. 
But these are no longer equivalent. Now, we analyzed the amount of nitrogens that was necessary for tree growth. This included shoots, roots, wood, nitrogen stored in the scaffold branches and the trunk, and nitrogen loss due to leaf and inflorescence abscission. And we calculated that we need an additional 21 pounds of nitrogen per acre, or 23.5 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Now, when this research was done, the California avocado industry was using ammonium nitrate as the fertilizer. So we calculated losses due to volatilization, nitrogen fixation in the soil, making it no longer available to the tree, and the amount of nitrogen that would be leached past the root zone. So we had to add another 20 um, pounds of nitrogen per acre, or another 22.6 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. When do we apply that nitrogen? Well, from the results of the research project led by Richard Rosecrantz, we analyzed fruit as they developed over time on a monthly basis. And so here we can see when nitrogen is taken up by the avocado fruit in California. And we see that initially, Nitrogen uptake really only starts at the end of June, beginning of July. These are the young developing fruit on the tree, and this is summer, nitrogen uptake. There's a major increase from August to September, which would be January, February in the Southern Hemisphere. And then there's a slow increase in nitrogen uptake from September through the end of October, which would be May through the end of April in the Southern Hemisphere. No nitrogen uptake in California during the winter. And then uh, the following year, in the spring, the mature fruit start to take up nitrogen. And they take up a large amount of nitrogen starting in April through June. Now, the amount of each nutrient required at key stages of avocado fruit development can be calculated using update take data like I've shown you here for nitrogen and using crop estimates to calculate the amount of nitrogen required for different levels of fruit production. Because we see that in the summer, the fruit are taking up 500 milligrams of nitrogen per fruit and then in spring the following year, the mature fruit take up another 500 milligrams of fruit, of nitrogen per fruit, sorry. One of the things that I have advocated um, through my research in California on nutrition is to fertilize the tree during periods of high nutrient demand in the phenology of the Haas avocado tree. And these are the periods of high nitrogen demand in the phenology of the Haas avocado tree grown in California. So basically, there are only two periods of high nutrient demand. The first is in the spring, where we have bloom. And bloom requires a lot of nitrogen. Inflorescences, on average, have 2.75% nitrogen. And you think of the thousands, hundreds of thousands of inflorescences on the tree. That's a lot of nitrogen. Those flowers are going to set fruit. So that's a process that requires nitrogen. We have spring shoot growth. Spring shoots are very important in California because they contribute 30% of the inflorescences at return bloom the following year. 
And in California, we still have the mature fruit on the tree in the majority of orchards. And as we saw in the previous slide, there's a significant uptake of nitrogen by the mature fruit starting in April and continuing through May into June until they are harvested. The second period of high nutrient demand is in the summer. So these new crop, the young developing fruit of the current crop, start taking up nitrogen just at the end of June into July, through August, into September, uh, and through the end of October. So we need to fertilize these fruit to support this period of exponential fruit growth. This is when the fruit achieves its maximum increase in size during the first part of their development. They increase in size the following spring as well. We also have our first root flush in the summer. This typically occurs at the end of June beginning of July. We need to support this root flush for the uptake of nutrients. But there's another reason why we need to support the root flush, and that is because the roots are the source of cytokinins for the tree. Nitrate and ammonia actually upregulate the gene that is essential for cytokinin biosynthesis. In other words, nitrate and ammonia regulate the activity of that gene. And that's so cytokinins which stimulate fruit growth and summer vegetative shoot growth will be coordinated with the availability of nitrogen. So we also have summer vegetative shoot growth. Now this summer vegetative shoot growth is very important. It produces 60 to 70 percent of the return bloom the following spring in California. So you cannot afford to have too little nitrogen and not support this growth because it will reduce bloom the following year. And as Jonathan pointed out, we have floral development initiated in the summer. At the end of July, beginning of August, buds on the summer vegetative shoots and the spring shoots transition from vegetative shoot development to floral development. And so this is important that we have one sufficient number of summer vegetative shoots to undergo this transition and two, that we have nitrogen to support this process. Now, I have a third smaller period of nutrient demand that I call a shadow period of nutrient demand. And this is especially important for nitrogen. If you have a heavy on crop on the tree and 10,000 pounds of fruit per acre or 11,000 200 kilograms of fruit per hectare is an on crop in California. We need to fertilize during this period of time to support the fall root flush so we can get the cytokinins that would be produced by this root flush and also the uptake of nutrients, especially because this root flush is a storage flush and we want it to store nitrogen to support bloom the following year. We also want to supply nitrogen in a non-crop year to keep exponential fruit growth going through the total period that this process occurs. And we want to support fall shoots so that we can pick up that extra 10% of inflorescences that the fall shoots contribute to return bloom the following year. Now, if you have a low yield on the tree and your fruit size is excellent and your summer vegetative shoot growth is going to give you a good bloom the following year, 
You do not need to supply fertilizer at this time. So it's important to note that you fertilize according to tree phenology, considering the nutrient demand of the current crop, which is in the summer, and last year's crop, which is in the spring, and your goals for next year's crop. Do you need to enhance flowering? If so, you need to do everything to support summer vegetative shoot growth and the fall shoots to enhance flowering. If your crop load is low and your summer vegetative shoot growth is good, then you're not, uh, you don't have to be as concerned about having a good return bloom. Dividing fertilizer rates or amounts into equal monthly or bi-monthly applications has the potential to under-fertilize periods of high nutrient demand and over-fertilize periods of low nutrient demand. So in this picture, I illustrated the period of high nutrient demand that occurs in the spring due to the mature fruit on the tree and in the summer um, due to the current crop on the tree, and then also the uh, growth of vegetative shoots and the bloom and the floral development that occurs later in the summer. When you divide your nitrogen into small applications, you maintain a nutrient level that's uniform throughout the year. And so this high demand that occurs in the spring-summer is not met, which has the potential to reduce fruit set, fruit size, and the growth of the summer vegetative shoots for return bloom. But in addition, you're now over-fertilizing the period in the winter where we saw nitrogen is not taken up by the trees in California. So basically, all of this nitrogen that you're applying is leaching past your root zone, not being taken up by the tree, and it's basically a waste of fertilizer dollars. Now I want to introduce the concept of sinks. Sinks are the energy and the nutrient demand of the tree. Reproductive structures have the greatest sink strength. So when there's competition for nutrients, the reproductive structures will win. So flowers will get the nitrogen that's available. When flowering is over, then the seeds become the strongest sink. And so the seeds will get the available nitrogen. And if there's not enough, then what happens is the fruit itself doesn't grow. We don't get the mesocarp, and so we have small-sized fruit. Now, fruit are a stronger straight sink than shoots. So if you have a lot of fruit on the tree, they're going to get the nitrogen, and the shoots will suffer. And so you don't get the summer vegetative shoot growth you need for a good return bloom. And the weakest sink on the tree or any plant is the roots. And if they don't get the nitrogen they need, they become weak roots and they don't grow adequately. That reduces water uptake, nutrient uptake. Weak roots are susceptible, more susceptible to Phytophthora, which is a weak pathogen, but it goes after weak roots. And we lose cytokinin biosynthesis that we need to support shoot growth and fruit development. Now, it's interesting that Jonathan mentioned that there, the government is now looking at how much nitrogen is being applied to crops. Because for the impetus for the first research that I did to match nitrogen fertilization application times and rates to tree demand was asked uh, by the California Avocado Commission to be done for the same reason, 
the government was starting to look at how much nitrogen was being applied and starting to regulate. And so to get out in advance of this, the California Avocado Commission asked us to look at what amount of nitrogen do we really need? Do we need twice as much as what we're applying? Because we don't want to get cut off at some low level when we really need more. So in this experiment, which was the first one we did for the California Avocado Commission, controlled trees received a single dose of nitrogen every other month, starting in January, for a total of five months. So they received 125 pounds of nitrogen. So the first application was made to the control trees in January, which would be July in the Southern Hemisphere. The second application was made in April in the Northern Hemisphere, October in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, August, uh, June, in the Northern Hemisphere, December in the Southern Hemisphere, August in the Northern Hemisphere, February in the Southern Hemisphere, and the last dose was in November, which would be May in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, for each of these application times, we had a separate set of trees that got an additional 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre or 28 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So one set of trees got 50 pounds of nitrogen in January or July in the Southern Hemisphere, or 56 kilograms per hectare this application time. Another set of trees got this double dose of nitrogen in April, which would be October in the Southern Hemisphere, June, December in the Southern Hemisphere, August, February in the Southern Hemisphere, November, and May. Out of all of these treatments, trees that received the double dose of nitrogen in April and November resulted in a net increase in four-year cumulative yield of 16,272 pounds per acre for the April application and 20,686 pounds of uh, fruit uh, for the November application. So this is the equivalent of 18,000 uh, kilograms per hectare for the April application and 22,754 kilograms per hectare for the double dose of nitrogen in November or May in the Southern Hemisphere. And these two treatments, April and November, resulted in a net increase of commercially valuable size fruit, packing carton size 48, 213 to 269 grams per fruit, of 5,553 pounds per acre for the April or October application, and 7,978 pounds per acre for the November or May application. So this is the equivalent of 6,200 kilograms per hectare for the May, uh, for the April, October application, and 8,935 kilograms per hectare for the November or May application. In addition, April and May double dose of nitrogen reduced the yield of fruit that were smaller than 178 grams of fruit grams per fruit, and also reduce the severity of alternate bearing. Now I want to point out something that's very important. Double dosing the trees in June, which would be December in the Southern Hemisphere, actually reduced yield. So there are definitely periods of time where high rates of nitrogen have a negative effect on yield. Now, in the second experiment, where we matched nitrogen fertilizer application times and rates to tree demand, we asked a different question. Because in the first study, we actually gave trees 25 pounds per acre, or 28 kilograms per hectare, more 
than the control trees. In this experiment, we asked the question of whether or not if we gave just single doses of nitrogen, but we gave those doses to what we believe the major periods of high nitrogen demand, would we produce high yields? And would those yields be equal to trees that were getting double doses of nitrogen in April and November? So in this experiment, we applied 25 pounds per acre, or 28 kilograms per hectare, in April, which would be October in the Southern Hemisphere, in July, in August, and in September in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, also in January and February in the Southern Hemisphere. And I misspoke. In this experiment, we did not apply nitrogen in September. Sorry, just July and August and January, February. We did apply nitrogen in November and May. So this is a total of 100 pounds of nitrogen or 112 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. This treatment resulted in a three-year cumulative total yield of 32,316 pounds per acre, which is the equivalent of 36,193 kilograms per hectare. So this is more on an average per year than 10,000 pounds per acre or 11,200 kilograms per hectare. This also resulted in a three-year cumulative yield of commercially valuable size fruit, 48s, 213 to 269 grams per fruit, of 10,772 pounds per acre, or the equivalent of 12,573 kilograms per hectare. So on an average annual basis, this would be more than 3,000 pounds of these commercially valuable size fruit per acre, or 4,000 kilograms of commercially valuable size fruit per hectare per year. Now, based on we, what we know now, the November nitrogen application should be shifted to the end of September beginning of October, which would be the end of March, beginning of April in the Southern Hemisphere. And that's because we saw in my earlier in my presentation that the young developing fruit on the tree are still taking up nitrogen in September and October. Also, we have the fall root flush that we want to support in a high yielding year, we want to continue to support fruit growth so that we achieve a good sized fruit. And in a high yielding year, we want to support fall shoot growth so we pick up that extra 10% of inflorescences at return bloom. So in this next slide, I compare nitrogen application times and rates applied to produce 10,000 pounds per acre or 11,200 kilograms per hectare based on the field research results versus the amount of nitrogen that was estimated to be required to produce this level of fruit production from the tree dissection or partitioning studies. So in the field research, we were applying 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre or 28 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare in April in the Northern Hemisphere or October in the Southern Hemisphere. But basically, it's a spring application to support flowering, fruit set, spring shoot growth, and the mature fruit that undergo exponential fruit growth in the spring in California. From July through um, the um, end of September, beginning of October, 
we applied three applications of 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre, or three applications of 28 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So July through September in the Northern Hemisphere, January through March in the Southern Hemisphere to support the current crop on the tree, especially if it's a high yielding crop, the two root flushes, the summer and fall vegetative shoot flushes, um, and, and to maintain good fruit size and support flower development. And I forgot to mention earlier, but Jonathan Dixon mentioned it. The, the floral development, the transitioning buds, that transition from vegetative to reproductive, in about October, they undergo irreversible commitment to flowering. And that means that they are destined to then be an inflorescence. If this development is not adequately supported, the transition fails to occur and vegetative shoot development continues, not floral development. So basically we used 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre or 112 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So if we look at the amount of nitrogen that would be applied based on the tree dissection or partitioning studies, we would divide the total amount of nitrogen to produce 10,000 pounds per acre or 11,200 kilograms per hectare as a spring application to support the mature fruit and a summer application to support the current crop. We would split the total amount of nitrogen for tree growth between spring and summer, and we would split the total nitrogen required to replace the nitrogen that's lost to leaching, volatilization, and fixation in the soil. So this is a total amount then in the spring of 42 pounds of nitrogen per acre, or 47 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. In the summer, we would have equivalent amounts for a total of, I wish I could get rid of this bar, yes, gone, 84 pounds of nitrogen per acre or 94 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So this is lower than what we would be applying. But if we had a lower yield, we would eliminate the 25 pounds of nitrogen, 28 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare applied in the fall. So we would then be applying 75 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre or 84 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, which would be slightly lower. The nice thing about using the nitrogen based on the tree dissection studies it allows you to fine tune the amount of nitrogen required by the crop. So you use an estimated yield and you simply multiply it by the amount of nitrogen required to produce 1,000 pounds of fruit per acre or 43 kilograms of nitrogen that's required to produce 1,000 kilograms per hectare. So you can adjust the amount of nitrogen if the mature fruit is a heavy on crop, but the current setting crop is a low yield off crop. Now there are many benefits of properly timing soil fertilizer applications to tree nutrient demand. Fruit number or crop load drives the uptake of many essential nutrients from the soil into other tissues in the tree, not just the fruit. Matching fertilization to periods of high nutrient demand related to the growth of the fruit and tree growth, floral and vegetative shoot development and fruit growth, increases the amount of applied fertilizer that is taken up by the tree. This improves the nutrient status of the tree, 
and therefore increases fertilizer use efficiency. Since more fertilizer is taken up by the tree, this improves the benefit to cost of your fertilization program. And since more applied fertilizer is taken up by the tree, it protects the environment. Less fertilizer is leaching past the root zone and finding its way into the runoff water in our lakes and streams or finding its way into the groundwater. Now, avocado trees do not live by nitrogen alone. They require 17 essential nutrient elements. Carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are gases. Carbon and oxygen enter into the three, tree through open stomates. And all three of these gases are taken up by the roots, dissolved in the water that is taken up by the roots. The trees need large amounts of these six macronutrients and smaller amounts of these eight micronutrients. Now, I've shown you this slide many times. According to the concept of the limiting factor, the tree cannot produce the maximum yield of commercially valuable sized fruit if all of these nutrients are not available at a level to meet the nutrient demand of the tree. So if there's not enough nitrogen or other nutrient, then we're going to get reduced yield and or reduced fruit size, less summer vegetative shoot growth, and poor return bloom. Now I want to show you uh, a couple of slides that show the uptake of specific nutrients because in California, the uptake of nutrients by the fruit is not always the same as nitrogen. Here you can see that there's no uptake of potassium into the young developing fruit until July. And then, like nitrogen, there's a significant increase from August to September, and then a slow increase through October. But we see that for potassium, there is continued uptake through the winter. And then again, there's a second major uptake by the mature fruit on the tree in year two, the following spring. And what we see is that twice as much potassium is taken up by the mature fruit in year two than by the young developing fruit in year one. So when you're dividing your potassium to be applied, you put one amount in the uh, current summer for the young developing fruit, and the following spring you have to supply twice as much. This is the uptake of calcium by avocado fruit in California. Again, you see that uptake begins in July, and it's rather dramatic through September with an additional small amount from September to October. This is the uptake by the young developing fruit. There is no uptake through the winter, and the mature fruit on the tree the following spring also do not take up calcium. So in providing calcium to your tree, you would only supply it in the summer to your current developing fruit. Now, I want to make everybody aware that there are new optimum leaf nutrient concentration ranges for California. You would use leaf nutrient analysis to monitor the success of your fertilization program. If you're under fertilizing, your nutrient levels are going to drop. If you're over fertilizing, your nutrient levels are going to increase. Now these new optimum ranges were developed by Dave Crowley, Salvatore Campisi Pinto, and I contributed because we used the data set that had 400 trees from Dave Crowley and my data set of 3,000 trees. And these new, 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 
These new nutrient ranges are tied to yield and food size. Only nitrogen in Embleton's old ranges was actually experimentally determined and tied to total yield. This column over here shows you uh, the highest uh, levels of nutrients that were observed in that 3,400 tree data set. In other words, what was most frequently happening in the trees in this data set in, from California. So what we can see is that the majority of growers in California are doing a good job with nitrogen fertilization. They're a little bit at the high end, and so you have to monitor to make sure you're not going to go above the optimum range. They're doing a good job with phosphorus. It's at the high end, so again, you want to monitor to make sure that you don't get to excessive levels of phosphorus. And they're doing a very good job with potassium. Calcium is deficient. Magnesium is uh, at the low end or below the optimum range. Sulfur is very deficient. Zinc is very deficient. Manganese is very deficient. Iron is good, but it's at the low end of the range. So again, it has to be monitored to make sure it doesn't go too low. Boron is very low, and you can't see it. Now you can. Um, uh, copper is high. Now, we have not quite figured out what the source of this copper is. Obviously, it's coming from the soil because we don't use a lot of copper sprays to control disease in avocado. So to summarize, we are over, we have too much copper in our trees. Phosphorus and potassium are on the high end of the optimal range and need to be monitored. We are severely under fertilizing with calcium, sulfur, zinc, manganese, and boron. And magnesium and iron are at the low end of the range and need to be monitored. Haas avocado trees producing over 285 pounds per tree, that's 31,500 pounds per acre, or the equivalent of 129 kilograms per tree, or 35,280 kilograms per hectare, had leaf nitrogen that was between 21 and 2.1 and 2.5%. As N increased to greater than 3%, yield decreased. Trees with the highest yield had nitrogen at 2.5%, phosphorus between 0.12 and 0.15%, and potassium at 0.9%. Low yielding trees had nitrogen greater than 3%, phosphorus greater than 0.2%, and potassium greater than 1.2%. So to maximize yield of commercially valuable sized fruit, growers need to maintain a balance between the number of fruit and healthy leaves for larger sized fruit. Leaves are the source of energy that is necessary for fruit growth. Growers need to maintain a balance between non-bearing and bearing shoots because bearing shoots in California do not flower the following year. So you need to prune to improve light penetration into the tree. No light, no flowers, no fruit. And you also need to prune to increase canopy complexity. You need to have shoots that are bearing mature fruit, shoots that are setting your current crop, and shoots that are not bearing any fruit that will produce the bloom the following year. If you have a heavy on crop on your tree, you need to prune early so that you stimulate shoot growth and those shoots have the potential to produce summer vegetative shoots 
that will mature and flower the following spring. You need to fertilize based on tree phenology to meet the nutrient demand of the inflorescences, young fruit, mature fruit, and the summer vegetative shoots, which produce 60 to 70% of the return bloom. Appleton's fertilizer uh, nutrient ranges were developed for replacement fertilization. This is not a good approach. Do not fertilize to replace what your previous crop used, especially if you have an alternate bearing orchard. If you just finish an on crop and you replace what that crop used, you're going to over fertilize an off crop and you're basically wasting fertilizer. If you just produced an off crop and you replace what that crop used, you're under fertilizing your on crop, which will result in small sized fruit and a worse return bloom. Maintain healthy roots for the uptake of water, nutrients, and the synthesis of cytokinins. And I thank you very much for your time. I think I was rather long. I apologize. Okay, thanks, Carol. So we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first one, and I know all of this data you shared came from quite a number of orchards over many years. Um, so it may be hard to answer this question. Did the growers perform a size pick early in the season on the trees that were used in this research? No, when we work with growers, uh, Sometimes they do a size pick and we add the yields together. So at that point, we can't really see what the true size of those fruit would be. But most of the time, with the people that we collaborate with, they're very accommodating and they allow us to pick all the fruit at the time that they want to put the fruit in the market. I think there was one GA3 study where we size pick. Okay, the second question. Is there any research on the timing of P and K application? Uh, yes, we did a study where uh, once we figured out that those four nitrogen applications in uh, April, I have, to have my cheat sheet to know what it is in the Southern Hemisphere. So April in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, October in the Southern Hemisphere, and then July, August through September, which would be February, March through April in the Southern Hemisphere. Once we figured out that those were the optimal times to supply nitrogen, we asked if we could further increase yield by also supplying phosphorus and potassium with that nitrogen. And what that study identified was that the best application time for, uh, for phosphorus and potassium was July and August, March, April. Now, that's a quandary because we saw that in the spring, the fruit are taking up twice as much potassium than they are during uh, the summer sheep growth period. But when we added phosphorus and potassium, maybe it's the phosphorus that's causing the problem, uh, to our spring application in April, we actually reduced yield. And in this study, the application of phosphorus and potassium at any time other than July and August, which would be uh, February and March in the Southern Hemisphere, reduced yield over just supplying nitrogen only. Okay, and currently the last question we have, and maybe Jonathan would like to jump in on this one too and offer his opinion. If I use chicken manure as fertilizer in an organic orchard, would the timing of applications be changed? I'll make one comment, but I'll let Jonathan fully answer that question. The problem with using organics like manure is that 
the nitrogen isn't immediately available when you apply it, as Jonathan stated in his presentation. So there are databases that show the rate at which um, these different organic nitrogen sources break down. And so you would have to time your application that you're getting the breakdown to release the maximum amount of nitrogen matching the period of high nutrient demand. And Jonathan and I, I leave that to you. <laughs> All right, Carol. Um, basically, uh, a good rule of thumb to use is, is put it on about a month ahead of the synthetic timing. Um, this, uh, because so much will depend on your soil life and the microbes that you have in your soil and their ability to process that um, manure. The, the thing is that not all chicken manures are the same. So some can be very high in ammonia, some can be uh, lower. Um, but, but basically a good rule of thumb is put it on a month ahead. So if you needed it for October um, in California, you would put it on in September. And um, just bear in mind too that it, as an organic product, your soil moisture is very important for making sure that the product will actually be activated and um, utilized in the in the soil. Um, it's not to say it's not a bad product to use, it, it can be quite useful. Um, but yeah, uh, the rule of thumb is, is about a month ahead of the synthetic timing, if you like. Okay, that was that was my thought too, Jonathan. That was probably about a month to allow that that breakdown and availability of it. Okay. Yeah, one thing I didn't mention in my talk was um, a lot of my fertilizer applications in my program are actually a month ahead of what Carol was talking about because we've had studies done that show it takes about three to four weeks for the solid fertilizer when it's applied to actually work down past the root zone. So that's why we chose a monthly application was that um, we figure that's the time where whatever fertilizer has had a chance to work its way down the, through the root zone has done so after about a month. And um, so that's where we're coming from on that, that side of things. And if I could just um, comment on that. so. The bulk of our irrigation, uh, our nitrogen and other nutrients are put in with the irrigation. So that does change things in California. Just want to make that clear. And then initially in our first uh, nitrogen study, where we applied the nitrogen in June and double dosed in June, that was what we were thinking. We wanted to put it on a month in advance of the July uptake of nitrogen. Um, but under California conditions, putting it in through the irrigation, that was not beneficial. Okay, quickly we have one last question for Carol. Is the timing of calcium application about the same as PNK? Uh, from the uptake I, uh, figure I showed you, I just want to be very clear that calcium is only taken up by the young developing fruit. And so the uptake stops uh, just about October. So July to October is when you would supply calcium. So you want to put small amounts of calcium to meet the needs of your tree. Whatever your annual amount of calcium would be needs to go on from July through October to get the total amount of calcium you need into the fruit for good uh, food quality. And this is the best time. Um, this was shown by uh, John Bauer for avocados and citrus in South Africa. So this is a, a well-known um, rule, I want to call it a fact, but this is a well-known rule for um, the uptake of calcium by young developers. I want to thank Carol and Jonathan once again for participating today, tomorrow, for Jonathan. <laughs> we appreciate you, you both being here and, and 
presenting all of the information you did. Um, I think the growers got a lot out of it. Um, there was a comment about some audio quality uh, later in the seminar. Um, this is being recorded and it will be on the, on the CAC YouTube channel. So hopefully if you missed anything, hopefully the recording will be okay. And that should be posted in a couple of days. Um, so if you, if you missed anything, you can go back and check that out. There's one more question that came in. Oh, thanks everybody. Yes, thank you, Sean. So with that, we will go ahead and end the webinar. Thanks everybody for participating. Thank you, Jim. Bye, Jonathan. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Carol.